Well, hello, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. I have not lived in Southern California, but I did live in Sacramento, California for six years. Uh, it was funny because I once uh, had someone tell me they could tell me they could tell I had lived in uh, Sacramento because I referred to San Francisco as Southern California. But I know this is the real Southern California that I'm talking to right now. So it is fantastic to be here. Now, when I work with someone who is just learning the Rust programming language, they sometimes question whether the Rust borrow checker, which is one of Rust's key uh, features, it's one of those ways we avoid dangling pointers and other memory safety issues. It's really useful, but they question whether it's their friend or their foe. If you take a look at the Rust subreddit, it's common to see posts with headlines like newbie question regarding the borrow checker, help fighting the borrow checker, and does it ever get easier fighting with the borrow checker? However, as I watch these same people get more experience in Rust, they do tend to come around to the borrow checker and realize what it protects them from doing. So in answer to the question, is the borrow checker a friend or a foe? I say the borrow checker will become your friend through experience. And along with gaining the experience with it, it's also very helpful to understand how it works and why it does the things it does. We're going to dive really deep into that, but before we do, as covered in the introduction, I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. I'm a principal software engineer at Microsoft. Prior to Microsoft, I was at Mozilla, and prior to that, I was at Chef Software. Uh, that's where I got my introduction to Rust. I was working on the Habitat project. I am also Microsoft's representative on the board of directors for the Rust Foundation, which has me a lot acting as bridge between the Rust community and Microsoft and vice versa. I'm also the lead editor of This Week in Rust. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with all the things the great Rust community is doing, uh, the tutorials they're writing for all levels, news, etc., I highly encourage you to subscribe to it. And I don't have a link ready for it, so if someone could put the link to subscribe to This Week in Rust in the chat, I would greatly appreciate it. Moving forward, uh, this is, let's set some expectations here. We'll first do a bit of a background on the Rust compiler and compilers in general in order to put the borrow checker in context. Then we will do a deep dive specifically on the Rust borrow checker. So let's go ahead and start with an overview of the Rust compiler as a whole. And let's take a look at a simple code example in Rust. This Rust function declares a vector composed of the integers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And after it declares this vector, it uses a for loop to iterate through each integer in the vector and print it out on a new line. If we were to run this code in our terminal, uh, let's use cargo run. Let's go ahead and run that. It's a way to run Rust code. Uh, as expected, we see the numbers 1 through 5 printed out on the screen. Now, this might seem pretty simple. Cargo build, which is, Cargo is Rust's packaging tool. It's a way of uh, managing your dependencies, also installing your dependencies, and running your Rust code. Cargo builds and runs this piece of code for us. But there is a lot that happens underneath the surface in the compiler when Cargo is building it. There are five general stages to compiling a piece of code. It starts with lexical analysis of the code, and then parsing of the code, followed by semantic analysis of the code. This is where the Rust borrow checker comes in. Then optimization of that code. And finally, code generation, where the compiler creates the executable binary of our code. When we look at all the stages laid out in a list like this, it seems like they would run linearly. And in some compilers, they do. However, if you've delved at all into the Rust compiler internals, you might be thinking or getting ready to tweet, wait a minute, isn't the Rust compiler at least partially query based rather than linear based? And the answer to this question is yes, but that is out of the scope of this particular talk. For the sake of clarity, I'll speak to the internals of the Rust compiler as if they were functioning linearly. However, 
If you want to delve more into how the Rust compiler is query based and what that means, check out the guide to Rust C development for more information. This guide has been a big help to me as I've learned how to hack on the Rust compiler. Would love if someone could do a search for that or go to that URL and uh, paste it in the chat for everyone to be able to reference. If not, I will paste a link to it at the end of this talk. Going back to the stages of compilation, let's start with the first one here, lexical analysis, and talk about how the Rust compiler executes this step. During lexical analysis, a program within the compiler called a lexer takes the raw Rust source code called a lexeme and analyzes it and then splits the code into tokens to make it easier for the compiler to parse. Then we move on to the next stage of compilation called parsing. And in the parsing stage, a program within the compiler called conveniently a parser takes, the, it takes and analyzes the tokens generated by the lexer and translates them into an abstract syntax tree or AST. Having the tokens in this AST data structure makes it much quicker and easier for the compiler to do the rest of its work. And at this stage, before it moves on to the next stage of compilation, the Rust compiler takes that abstract syntax tree generated by the parser and first expands any macros included in the code. So let's look back at our Rust code. And if we look back at our code, let's take a closer look at this line, our print line statement. Print line in Rust is a macro. When this macro is expanded, it looks like this. This is what the full print line macro looks like and how it will be represented in the abstract syntax tree. So we're taking our Rust code from, from something that's you know fairly straightforward for a human developer to parse and making it easier for the compiler to parse it. Then after the macros are expanded, I, the compiler also desugars some of the syntactic sugar that makes writing Rust so delightful. For example, in Rust, the for loop is a piece of syntactic sugar for an iterator. If we were to desugar this section of code, it would consist of both a match statement and a loop. The functionality of this code is identical to the for loop, but again, desugaring it makes it easier for the compiler to understand it and to optimize it to make it easier for the machine to read and execute the code. And at this time, the compiler also resolves any imports in the code. So if we were to importing an external crate, uh, crate is a word for a Rust library. If we were bringing in an external crate or using even internal crates or modules, libraries within our code, these would be resolved here as well. Then the compiler, after these steps, takes that abstract syntax tree, which we just expanded the macros of, we desugared it, and we uh, resolved all the imports. It takes that AST and converts that AST into a higher level intermediate representation, or HIR. And let's pause here and take a closer look at the HIR. It helps to, in order to understand the HIR, it really helps to understand the data structures that make up the HIR. The first is a node. This corresponds to a specific piece of code. This is identified by an HIR ID or HERE ID. You will hear the high level intermediate representation refer, refer to as both HIR or HERE. Neither is right or wrong, but it helps to know that they both exist. And that node belongs to a definition. A definition is an item in the crate we are compiling. And these are primarily, primarily top level items within the crate, within that Rust crate that we are compiling ourselves. This is identified by a def ID. And a definition is owned by a crate. This is the crate we are compiling with Rust. This is the crate we wrote the code in Rust, and now we're compiling it. So this crate data structure stores the contents of the crate we are compiling, the code, and also contains a number of maps and indexes and other things that help organize the content for easier access throughout the compilation process. 
this crate is identified with a crate num. Now that's a lot I just threw at you. So let's look at another visual. Let's look back at the original source code we are compiling. And let's focus on this section here, that for loop that iterates through the numbers vector. Remember, at this point, this for loop has been desugared into a match statement and a loop. If we look at the node in the HIR that represents this match statement, we would see something similar to this. Now, this is a little, this is a little harder for parsing with human eyes, so let's go ahead and break it down. The arm struct represents a single arm of the match statement that our for loop D sugared into. First, we have the here ID for this piece of code. This identifies a node within the HIR or here or higher level intermediate representation. And that node is owned by a definition. The definition is some top level item in the crate. And that definition data structure is owned by the crate data structure. So our for loop is a node within a definition within our crate. And that's how we can identify where this node corresponds to in our original code. What also helps us do that is what's called a span. The span is what stores the file path, line numbers, and column numbers of the original source code. This will be very important in the future as we optimize and desugar this Rust code, which we've already done some of at this point. If we encounter a problem with the code, or if the compiler encounters a problem with the code after it is desugared and optimized, it still needs to be able to show the user, the person who wrote the original Rust code, where in that original source code that the error was generated from. If we were to show them the desugar code, which would be different from the code they wrote, it wouldn't mean much to them. We want to make it very easy for them to know what part of the code might be causing an error, which helps them understand how to fix it. The compiler then takes the HIR and lowers it again into the mid-level intermediate representation, also known as the MIR or MIR. The MIR is constructed as a control graph. And the units within this graph are called basic blocks, which are identified with values like BB0 and BB1. Within these blocks, each has a sequence of statements that execute in order. And the very last statement in a basic block is known as a terminator. This controls when and how the program proceeds to another basic block. Now, this is a pretty sam simple example. There's only one direction that BB0 can go. It can only go to BB1. However, let's look at something just a little more complex. What if our code had an if-else statement in it? Well, if we were to look at the, uh, the mere data structures for this, the terminator of BB0 would have the option to either proceed to BB1 or BB2, depending on the result of the if else statement. In this case, there's more than one path that the program can take when it encounters the terminator in BB0. Now, there are definitely more data structures involved in the mirror if you are curious. And if you are curious, want to learn more, definitely check out that guide to Rust C development. It goes much, much deeper and provides a lot of great information. So going back to our code, let's go back to our D sugar code and let's zoom in on this match statement, which is assigned to a variable called result. If we looked at the mirror, the mid-level intermediate representation for this piece of code, it would look similar to this. Now, it's much wordier uh, looking at the actual uh, mirror output, but I've simplified it a bit for the sake of appearing on a slide. Up here in the top left, we have our basic block identified as BB2. And then we have what is called a local. A local in the MIR represents a place in memory or more specifically, a place in the stack frame. In this case, underscore five corresponds to the value of the variable results. 
And like in the nodes in the high level intermediate representation, we have a span, the piece of the original Rust source code that each node in the MIR corresponds to. Again, if we encounter an error when we're operating with the MIR, we can still easily refer to what lines in the original source code caused the error. And that brings us to the third stage. And this stage is big in the Rust compiler, semantic analysis. This is where the compiler tries to figure out what the programmer is trying to do in a way the compiler can understand it and then translate it into machine code. And at this point, after it's lowered the HIR into the MIR, the Rust compiler will run several checks on the code, including the borrow checker. And we'll come back and dive deep into that borrow checker in just a few moments. But for now, let's finish up the stages of compilation. And let's focus on these last two, optimization and code generation. These stages are where the code is transformed into an executable binary. And in the Rust compiler, we use LLVM to do this for us. LLVM is a commonly used collection of modular and reusable compiler and toolchain technologies. The Rust compiler uses it to further optimize the code and generate the machine code to run it. Now, I do want to add there is an effort in the Rust community to use GCC in replace of LLVM in certain ways that you can build the Rust language. Um, if you're curious about that, definitely ping me after the meeting. Happy to connect you with the people doing that work. Before it gets to the LLVM stage, and this is one of the key parts the GCC I, working group is working on, is it the compiler takes the MIR we created earlier and lowers it into the LLVM intermediate representation or LLVM IR. And if we look at what that would look like, it's pretty unreadable to humans, but it looks something like this. As you can see, it's also organized into basic blocks like the MIR, like the MIR. And we then use LLVM and pass it the LLVM IR intermediate representation and then it runs more optimizations on the on the LLVM IR and emits machine code. It then links the machine code files together to produce the final binary. And this is what is run when we call cargo run. So when we call this command, we see these numbers printed out. This is the result of running our code. So yay, that gives you a bit of an idea of how the compiler works to take your Rust source code and make it something a computer can execute. And at this point, I want to go back and take a deeper look at the borrow checker. This is one of the key features of Rust. It's one of the things that makes Rust different from many other languages. Let's take a closer look at it. And in order to do that, let's use a different piece of code. Now, if you are an experienced Rust programmer, you've dabbled in Rust, and you're looking at this code and thinking, this is going to error out, well, you are right. But we'll see how and why that happens in just a moment. First, let's go through this code line by line. We declare the variable x and give it the type of string. And then we set the value of x to the string hi Rust Lab. Uh, Rust Lab was a conference that I gave this talk at as well. Then we say that the variable y's value is equal to the value of the x variable. And then we attempt to print both variables out on the console. Now, when we try to build this piece of code with cargo build, we try to compile it, we get an error. And this error is a result of the borrow checker. Let's go through how the borrow checker identified this error and what it means. The borrow checker does several things, including tracking initializations and moves. How this plays out in our code is when we start with this first line where we declare the variable x with a type of string, x is not actually initialized yet. It won't be considered initialized until it is assigned a, a value. If we look at the MIR for this line of code, we see that X is represented by the local underscore one, and local underscore one is assigned the type of string, 
but has not been assigned a value yet. Now let's look at this line of code where we create and assign the high Rust Lab string to the variable X as the value of the variable X. Now that X has a value, it is considered initialized at this point. We create a new place in memory, local underscore two, where we store this high Rust Lab string. So we're creating it within our memory. And then we move the value stored at underscore two to underscore one. Remember, underscore one corresponds to the X variable. So we have created the string in memory and then move that string to be the value of X. Now let's look at this line where we attempt to create the variable Y and assign it to the value of X. This line is where the value of X is moved to Y. If we look at the MIR created for this line of code, we see that Y is assigned to the local underscore three. Remember, a local represents a place in memory. And underscore three is given the type string. And then the value at underscore one, remember that represents X, is moved to the value of underscore three, which represents Y. When we get to the next line in our code, when we try to print out X after we've moved the value of X into Y, X is not initialized at this line, so we cannot print it. And that's what generates this particular error. This error tells us we're attempting to use the value of a variable, in this case, X, after it has been moved. And the, compile, the Rust compiler does not allow us to do this, unless we are running it within an un unsafe block, but most of the time you're running it as normal Rust code. And something I'd like to specifically call out is how the compiler shows where the error was generated from in the original source code through a span. Even though we had lowered this code to MIR or mid-level intermediate representation, we still tracked what items in the MIR corresponded to what places in the original Rust code. This is very helpful to the end user. What is also helpful is this. The Rust compiler, it not only tells you what the error is and where it is, it gives you a command to get even more information about the error so that you can fix it. If we run this command, we see not only an explanation of the error, but also a piece of example code that would generate it. Then the message we receive when we run this command gives us even more information about how to fix it. This suggests using a reference to borrow a value rather than attempting to move the value, which is what we saw done in the MIR representation of our code. So let's integrate this into our Rust code. Let's change this line so that Y is assigned to a reference to the value of X. That's what that ampersand before X means, rather than moving the value of X into Y. We are referencing the value, we're not moving the value of X. If I make this change and then run my code using cargo run, once the compiler builds the code and executes it, I will see the message high Rust Lab printed out twice. So rather than fighting the Rust borrow checker, we used it to make our code even better. And along with tracking initializations and moves, the borrow checker also deals with lifetime inference. And let's go over what that means. Rust uses the word lifetime in two distinct ways. The first is to refer to the lifetime of a value. That's the span of time before the value is freed. Another word for referring to the lifetime of a value is referring to a variable scope. Let's see how this plays out in our code. And let's start with this first line where we assign the value of X as this string. At this point, X is live. Its lifetime begins here. And when we get to here, this is the, the old code that we get the compiler error on. 
when we move the value of X into Y, that is the end of X's lifetime. And then when we get down here and try to use X again, X is dead. His lifetime's over at this point. His lifetime is no longer in effect, which is why this program will error out when we try to compile it. It's very nice to catch this at compile time and not at runtime. The other way Rust uses the term lifetime is refer to refer to the lifetime of a reference to a value. This is the span of code in which the reference can be used. Let's look at our corrected code, where we assign the value of y to be a reference to the value of x. If we look at the MIR for this line of code, we remember that local underscore one refers to x, and local underscore three refers to y. And we see here that underscore, that underscore three local is assigned a reference to the value of underscore one. Looking back at our code, let's alter this slightly. We know this code will compile successfully, but let's alter it slightly. Let, let's play with it a bit. And let's try to drop the value of the variable X before we try to print out the value of Y. If we were to run this code, and we try to build it using cargo build, and we try to compile it, I should say, not try to run it. When we try to compile it, we get an error. We can't use X because it is borrowed, and that borrowed value is used later. The borrow checker tells us that X, because it is referenced by Y, needs to stay alive for at least as long as Y needs to stay alive. This is how we avoid dangling pointers. X's lifetime must be greater than or equal to Y's for this code to be valid to compile. Looking closer at the code, Again, this is X's lifetime from where we, uh, I should alter that slightly. Uh, the lifetime begins when we uh, assign the value of the string high rust lab to X. And then we borrow the value of X and assign it to Y. And then this is what needs to be the lifetime of Y, which is a reference to X. Notice that even though the, they overlap because we drop X, X's lifetime ends before Y's lifetime is supposed to end. Y can no longer reference the value of X after this line, after we drop the value of X. All references become uh, invalid at this point. And at this point, uh, Y along with X would be dead. Uh, it can't point to a value that has been dropped. In order for this code to compile, the lifetime of X must last at least as long as the lifetime of Y. The overarching way the scope and the lifetime of a reference relate to each other is that if you make a reference to a value, the lifetime of the reference cannot be longer than the scope of the value. As I move toward concluding this presentation, I want to make sure you know that there is so much more to the Rust compiler and the borrow checker. Again, if you want to know more, check out that guide to Rust C development. It was a great resource for me as I learned to hack on the compiler, and I'm sure it will be a great resource for you as well. Going back to this question from the beginning, is the borrow checker a friend or a foe? I say it's a friend though a very strict one. But the best thing about this friend is it will not only tell you when something is wrong, it will also tell you how to fix it. And I find that to be one of the best qualities I could find in a friend, as well as one of the best qualities I could possibly find in a compiler. Thank you.